Testing, testing. Uh, hello, everyone. Oh. <laughs> Uh, once again, my name is William Mills, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak here and the opportunity to preach. Uh, as many of as you know, uh, Pastor Brand has been preaching his, his sermon series, We Know Not the Hour. Uh, he's been talking about the second coming and how we should live to be prepared for the second coming. And while I'm not uh, continuing that necessarily, I did want the topic of my presentation to, to fall in with that theme. So if you could turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And if we could stand for this one, because we're going to be we're going to be coming back to these verses a lot. And I'm, uh, I'm reading from the, the NIV. And it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, uh, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. Uh, this is your true and proper worship. Uh, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Uh, the title of today's message is How to Serve the Master. How to Serve the Master. Uh, you may be seated. We're going to be talking about selflessness today, and specifically misconceptions about selflessness. Let's open with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for bringing us all here safely today, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to preach your word. I ask that you will fill me with your Holy Spirit and speak to us today. Uh, don't let me speak unless you're speaking. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, so because selflessness is an attribute of God's character, Satan has done everything that he can to make it look as unattractive to the world as possible. Uh, in misrepresenting the true nature of selflessness, uh, Satan has painted a false picture of God's character, and he has misrepresented the expectations that God has for how his people are to behave. Uh, the first misconception about selflessness that I want to talk about is the idea that selflessness means that you have to forsake yourself altogether. Uh, there are many Christians, myself included, who have at times fallen into the trap of believing or thinking that they don't matter. Uh, they give themselves wholeheartedly to the service of others. Uh, they'll read verses like Luke chapter 9, verse 23, where Jesus says, If anyone desires to come after me, uh, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. But ignore verses like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verse 19, which says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in us. Uh, the problem with this mindset is that it ignores the method in which God wants us to be selfless. In order for us to serve others, we need to maintain the tools that God has given us to serve others, those tools being our minds and our bodies. Uh, this principle applies in the secular realm as well. Uh, in my case, I've got a laptop that I use for school. Uh, in fact, most of my assignments are done on my laptop. If there's a problem with my laptop, it's my responsibility to get that laptop fixed. I can't go to my professors with a problem with my laptop and say, hey, I didn't complete this assignment because I was slow in fixing this problem with my laptop. Uh, the same rule applies with my own body as well. I was, I was sick last weekend. I, had, I think the pollen was getting to me and I ended up getting pretty sick. I was actually scared that I wouldn't be able to present this Sabbath. Uh, and it was my responsibility to get the rest that I needed so that I could be nursed back to health so that I can go back to getting the work done that I need to get done. Uh, if we go back to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, a holy and pleasing to God, because this is your true and proper worship. Uh, now pay attention to what he says in this verse. He does not say a dead sacrifice. Uh, he does not say a, a barely alive sacrifice. No, he says a living sacrifice. So what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? It means that I'm supposed to care for the life that God has given me and then submit that life to him. Uh, it means that instead of doing what I want to do with my mind and body, I do what God wants me to do with my mind and body. I take, I take care of the soul that God has given me, and then I let him decide how my soul is used. Uh, 
Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate example of what it looks like to be submitted to God, took care of himself. Jesus was not unhealthy mentally, physically, or spiritually. He ate, he drank, he slept. Uh, he always made sure that he had time to spend with the Father. Uh, when, it came for when it came time for Jesus to pray to the Father, uh, there was no human being who, who could get in his way. True selflessness is taking care of yourself so that you can be of service. Uh, a perfect example of this is the Sabbath commandments. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8, God says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. God commands us to spend six days serving others. Now, of course, serving others is not limited to those six days. We've got Compassion Sabbath next week. Uh, but you understand what I'm saying. And he commands us to rest on the seventh day so that we can regain the strength that we need to go back to serving others the next week. Uh, the second misconception about selflessness that I want to speak about is the idea that selflessness means that you value others more than you value yourself. Uh, this is an unbiblical mindset. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14, Paul writes that all of the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says the same thing in Matthew chapter 22 in verses 35 through 40. It says that then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Uh, Jesus said to him, You shall love your Lord, your, the Lord your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Uh, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. A true selflessness is not, loving, is, love, is not loving others more than yourself or loving others less than yourself. True selflessness is loving others just as much as you love yourself. Uh, and it is this principle that defines all of God's character. Uh, this was the mindset that Jesus had when it came to the salvation of humanity. Jesus values the salvation of you and I not less than and not more than, but just as much as he values his own life. Uh, we can see this evidence in the resurrection. Jesus was willing to give up his life for humanity, but he did not stay dead. This tells us that Jesus values his life, not less than and not more than, but just as much as he values the lives of you and I. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 29, Paul makes this statement about Christ in the church. For no one hated his own flesh, uh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Uh, the reason why we as the church are called the body of Christ is because Jesus holds us in the same regard that he holds his own body. From the perspective of Jesus, the love that he has for himself and the love that he has for us are not mutually exclusive. Instead, they go hand in hand. And this is the same kind of love that God wants us to show to others. We should not view the love that we have for ourselves and the love that we have for others as mutually exclusive. Instead, they go hand in hand. We need to take care of ourselves so that we can be of service to others. We need to care for our minds and our bodies so that God can use us to complete his mission. Uh, the third misconception about selflessness that I want to talk about is the idea that being selfless means that you're not allowed to think about your own happiness or fulfillment. In Hebrews chapter 12 in verse 2 it says, uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy that was set before Jesus when he was on the cross was the chance to have a reconciled relationship with you and I. Jesus' death on the cross was the most selfless act in all of history, and yet, whilst Jesus was on the cross, he was thinking about his own happiness. He was thinking about how happy he was going to be when he would get the chance to see you and I in heaven with him. You see, selflessness does not mean the absence of happiness. Rather, selflessness is the pathway to happiness that God has given us. And when all is said and done, it will be the results of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross 
that bring both him and us the greatest happiness. You see, I mention this point because with all of the difficulties and stresses that come with living in a sinful world, it's easy for us to forget what God's ultimate desire is for us. God wants us to be happy. Uh, in Ellen White's second volume of Mind, Character, and Personality, she writes this. She says, the Bible presents to our view the unsearchable riches in immortal treasures of heaven. A man's strongest impulse urges him to seek his own happiness. And the Bible recognizes this desire and shows us that all of heaven will unite with man in his efforts to gain true happiness. It reveals the condition upon which the peace of Christ is given to men. It describes a home of everlasting happiness and sunshine where no tears or want shall ever be known. Now this happiness is not something that we can achieve on our own. Uh, the unselfish love that God has, uh, the love that gave us a pathway to this happiness is not something that we can achieve by our own strength. The only way for us to love like Jesus is to be in a transforming relationship with him. And now within that relationship, there are three methods that God uses to give us the unselfish love that he has. The first is prayer. We need to ask God to give us his unselfish love. Uh, we need to ask him to make us selfless. The reason for this is because God is not going to force his character upon us. We need to communicate with him that we are interested in becoming like him. The second thing we need to do is that we need to be willing to allow God to change the details of our lives. It's not enough for us to ask God to make us selfless. We also need to allow him to make the changes necessary in order to produce selflessness in us. If there's something that God needs us to give up, we need to allow him to give us the strength to give it up. Uh, if there's something that God needs you to start doing, something that might be outside of your comfort zone, you need to allow God to give you the strength to do that as well. The third method is through our devotional lives. Uh, in Steps to Christ, Ellen Wright wrote this about the disciples. She said that the early disciples became more and more like Christ when they kept their eyes on him. Uh, when they heard his words, they felt they needed him. They looked for him, found him, and followed him. They were with him in the house and sat at the table with him. They were with him indoors and outdoors. Uh, they were his pupils, listening every day to his lessons of holy truth. They looked to him as servants look to their master to learn their duty. The time we spend with God is not only key in maintaining our relationship with God, but it's also key in our sanctification process. Uh, the presence of God is transforming. In the same way that Moses' face was glowing when he came down from the mountain because he had been in the presence of God, our lives will shine with God's glory the more time that we spend with him. As I come to a close, these are the things that I want to challenge you with today. And so, therefore, brothers and sisters, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, because this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for bringing us all here and uh, giving us the opportunity to, to hear from you and to learn from you. I ask that you won't forget the words that we have heard today. Even though it was a short message, I ask that you will help us to carry this with us into the week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.